place we've always belonged Right here Take me back to the garden Lead me back to the moment I heard your voice Take me back to Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Welcome to service. Uh, if you would all rise to your feet with me at this time. Let's take a moment to posture our hearts and our minds before the Lord. Just take a moment to really ask the Lord for him to come and to meet with you today. Say, Lord, I'm here ready to ready to hear from you, ready to meet with you. May you come alive in my heart. Can you pray that prayer as we begin our time together? Let's take a moment to do that now. Jesus, may you come. Jesus, may you come.
God, we know that you're already here. Good, but, but God, we just want to take a moment and turn our hearts and our minds to you. God, that we would posture ourselves open and ready for how you may move in this place, how you may move in our hearts this morning. God, may you, may your presence really fill us, Lord, and help us to experience a hope and a joy, Lord God, that can only come from you this morning. Bless our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Let's all sing together.
Lord, as we gather this morning, that is our prayer. God, that we would look to you and your goodness and your faithfulness. God, that has been consistent. God, I pray that as we come together as a church, may we look to you. God, that we would be on our knees, that we would lift up our songs of praise and worship and really surrender our hearts before you, God. God, you are our almighty fortress. May you come, Lord, come alive in our hearts today. May we be led by your spirit, Jesus. We thank you, Lord.
Great is your faithfulness, Jesus. Great is your faithfulness that is consistent, Jesus. Great is your faithfulness, Jesus. Hey, yeah. Can we take a moment right now faithfulness over your heart that as we come before the Lord that we can have confidence and boldness in the Lord's faithfulness that we can come together especially as we navigate difficult circumstances in our country in our world right here in our church that we can trust and look to his goodness and his faithfulness over our hearts and our lives can we just take a moment now and just pray for that, for your brothers and sisters and for yourself around you. Let's take a moment now and pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to declare, God, that your faithfulness is here in this moment right now, God. Jesus, I pray, Lord Father, God, may we have it. May we find our hope and our trust in you, Jesus. I pray, Lord Father, God, that we would. In moments of the chorus one more time. Great is your faithfulness. So great is your faithfulness to me. And great the sun will rise each morning you are faithful I pray God that we would be reminded of that truth as we come before your throne this morning God we thank you for your consistency God we thank you for your goodness and kindness and we're grateful to be in your presence today continue to speak to us and come alive in us we pray these things in your name amen y'all may be seated Good morning, Tapestry. I said good morning, Tapestry. I said it twice because there's so much stuff to be excited about today. First and foremost, welcome to all of you who are visiting us for the first time. You picked a great day to do it because there's a lot of wonderful stuff going on. Uh, if you are visiting us, please visit us at the welcome table and uh, give us your information so we can follow up with you and start embracing you with the arms of tapestry. Um, so the, the thing that I'm most excited about today is the missions marketplace. Uh, there's so much going on. How many people are excited about short-term missions? Yes, exactly. And we can translate that excitement by uh, visiting the booths and uh, the many delicious things that have been made for you, including Brazilian cheese bread and uh, delicious like uh, beverages and things like that. There's also a raffle going on right now um, that will go on through this evening. Uh, what's on, the prizes for the raffle are incredible, including um, a cabin in Mammoth that you can uh, get for free if you win the raffle. Uh, well, you don't 
get the cabin. You get a weekend in the cabin uh, in Mammoth, uh, along with other prizes that are part of the raffle. In addition to the raffle, there is an auction going on where you can bid on some pretty incredible items. Everything from um, uh, a weekend stay at the Disney Aulani Resort in Hawaii to, um, to uh, various lessons like baseball lessons, massage lessons, um, a lot of like artisanal goods, handcrafted uh, artwork, things like that. Um, and uh, some lawyer, uh, some immigration attorney is offering her uh, legal services. Uh, I guess she's a very popular lawyer in Los Angeles has over a hundred five-star Yelp reviews. I think her name is Jane, something like that. So please, please um, participate and bid on items. Um, uh, buy a raffle tickets, they're $10 each, or buy a, a delicious food or, um, or a beverage. Um, at the very least, stop by and encourage these incredible people that have prepared through a very short preparation season but are still faithfully going out. Um, and I know this announcement has been so effective that you guys are really excited. So what I want to do is I want to ask everybody to raise their hands with me right now. Raise your hands. Everybody, please raise your hands. Don't be too cool to do this. Everybody raise your hands. Okay. And say with me, I am part of Ascending Church. Today, I commit to spend at least $10 at the Missions Marketplace. Keep your hands up. But most likely more than $10. Okay, you can lower your hands. And remember, God sees everything. God sees everything. So let that be your guide. Okay, so please participate, get excited. Who's excited about Dodgers, Dodgers this season? Come on, who's excited about the Dodgers this season? Not even a yell from Pastor Charles, okay. Uh, but we are going to do a church-wide Dodger game. Uh, we're going to go on July 8th. The Dodgers are playing the Cubs at 710. Discounted tickets are $30 per person, and there's a limited number of tickets, so sign up ASAP. If you have any questions, you can email hello at tapestry.la. It's always a wonderful opportunity for you to get to know people outside of your friend circle or your cell at church. Uh, it's a real family-feeling event, so please join us. Who's excited about basketball? All right, all right. I know you guys are all thinking about your pledge right now. You're like, how much more than $10 can I spend at the marketplace? So that's okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you to whoop uh, too much during the rest of this uh, announcement. Um, but season 8 of our basketball league is here. Come in fellowship in um, in a competitive and co-ed basketball league that's co-ed that will start mid-July and run for about 10 weeks. Uh, all games are occurring on Sundays, so it should be easy to make in terms of your schedule. But make sure you sign up fast because we have a cap to ensure a smooth season. So feel free to email sports at tapestry.la with questions. Uh, and you can sign up through our website or through our TAP app. All of the signups uh, are through those, uh, those places. Uh, our Royal Family Kids Camp, which is an amazing ministry that we do for foster children in LA, we do a week-long camp uh, that, uh, that the people who are in charge of that ministry, ministry have been dedicatedly preparing for. Uh, they do uh, a number of events that involve costumes. And so we're asking people who have costumes uh, for kids between the ages of 6 to 12 years old uh, to drop them off, any costumes you have, as well as any sort of... Uh, clothing in good condition that you have for kids of that age, feel free to drop them off in the booth, in the foyer, all the way through June 26th. So if you have something, please bring it by and bless our kids along with our ministry. Uh, we're doing a new ministry called Spaces. Uh, and what Spaces is going to be is it's a six-week program for you to intentionally do in a non-judgmental way to discuss and to deep dive into a, uh, an issue that may be something that's on your heart. Uh, the issues that we're going to be doing spaces for in this first session are uh, there's going to be a co-ed group uh, focused on the topic of grief, a uh, women's group focused on the topic of sexuality, a men's group focused on the topic of lust and pornography, and a, a, mom support, a, a new mom support group. So if this is something that you're interested in uh, 
engaging with, with uh, not in a non-judgmental space with other members of the tapestry community, um, please sign up and check out Spaces. Um, that's, and it's going to be starting, I think, um, at the end of June, if I'm not uh, incorrect. Uh, VBS, who's excited for VBS? Yes, we love our children. So uh, this year we're doing a theme called Monumental VBS. It's a summer event that will help our children discover um, their longing for God, uh, discover God is longing to love them and have a relationship with them. It's gonna happen from July 14th through 16th. And you can expect a time full of faith, discoveries, memorable music, and epic adventures. Um, so please sign up, early sign up is available now if you want your kitties to experience uh, VBS. Uh, we're having a tap connect um, in, let's see, what's the date for tap connect? Oh, June 5th. Today. <laughs> it's happening today. Thank you. At uh, John and Loretta Law's home in Arcadia after second service. If you're not familiar with Tap Connect, it's a chance to uh, get to know our church, understand our history, and to meet some of our leaders and to get to know us better. So uh, if you're here for the first time and you really love what you see, please come to John and Loretta's home. If you've signed up, don't forget to go. It's going to be a blessed time. Uh, as always, if you missed anything in my announcements, you can check out our website or our app, uh, and you'll find links to upcoming events there. And here's Nicole with our scripture reading. The scripture today comes from Revelation 2, verses 1 to 5. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This is a reading of God's word. You may be seated. On. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole. Um, you, you know, I, I know we don't have too much time, but I just feel like maybe we can take a moment and pray together. Uh, we had a sister in the first service who uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and we took a moment to pray. But I realize um, this is something that's more uh, common, and a lot of us are kind of dealing with. Uh, so if, if you are somebody who's kind of dealing with the sickness, uh, we don't need to know the details. Uh, if you know like a parent or someone you love who may have cancer or some type of sickness and you want just, just to receive prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand. And as a church, we're going to just kind of pray for you. So if you know somebody who is struggling with some kind of sickness, please stand. Uh, we just want to lay hands on you. Uh, this could be a family member, somebody that uh, is going through something. It could be you. Um, so if we can just pray. Um, you know, the scripture tells us that if someone is sick, especially in the book of James chapter 5, call the elders together and lay hands and anoint them with oil and pray for them. It is because there's this conviction among God's people that we follow after a God who heals and that he's ready to heal at any moment. So with that faith, um, just look around a little bit. There's a handful of us standing. If you can just find your hands or reaching in the direction of someone standing. We don't know a lot of details. It's okay. We're just going to lay hands and just believe on the Lord that he's going to do his healing work amongst us and that he's going to receive the glory because he is a God who heals. Let's close our eyes. Just take a moment and just pray for the person who's standing there. Lord, we just recognize that our world is broken,
full of sin and the consequences of sin. Lord, there is all sorts of unintended health issues. And Lord, we want to attend to them now in prayer because we believe in the God who heals. Lord, it's telling that when you came, Lord, the way you are described is how you went from village to village to lay hands on those who were sick and you would bring healing to their bodies, their minds, and their souls. Father, we believe in you, that you are able to move this mountain of illness. Lord, we pray in faith that you would be gracious and kind towards us. Will you remove every cancerous cell? God, we recognize, Lord, that you can do it, Father, in faith, Lord. Lord, bring healing to the body of Christ. Those of us who are sick amongst us, we pray that you would anoint with oil. Lord God, we will not simply just be resigned. We will not simply accept our faith. We'll believe in the God who is able to heal. So let's bring your healing touch upon your church and heal us. Heal our parents, Lord, who may be sick. Heal our friends and our siblings who are, Lord, debilitated by some kind of sickness right now. God, through our prayer, may we be channels, facilitators of your healing through our prayer right now, Lord. We believe in the God who heals. May you heal us and be gracious to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I want to introduce to you our guest speaker. This week we've been spending some time with our little family of churches, what we call AMI, Acts Ministries International. Uh, and we're lucky to have Pastor Young Kim all the way from Philadelphia. Um, there's so many things I love about Pastor Young. And I, I know you guys know him already. He's been a guest speaker a number of times here. But I don't know if I've ever mentioned what I really love about him is how he's always raising up young pastors. I, I like to think that I'm one of those young pastors. Um, but he, he's been able to raise so many young, capable leaders and sent them out to plant churches. Our most recent church plant is a church called Canvas in Philadelphia. And this is someone that he's able to, he was able to support and raise up and send out to plant a new church. He is also presently partnering with a church in Italy where it's going to become, I think, sometime soon an AMI church. So we're excited that we'll have a sort of our foot footprints uh, in Italy, in Europe. Um, he's going to encourage you to go and do some mission work out there. So that should be a lot of fun. But we want to welcome Pastor Young to the front to give us our message. Thank you. All right, praise the Lord. Yeah, I, mean, I have to uh, suffer and take a scouting trip to Italy. And uh, if, if the Lord opens the doors, uh, maybe we'll share it with tapestry, depending on how good you guys are today. Amen? <laughs> uh, today's message uh, I want to share is pursuing intimacy with Jesus. And, you know, I'm really excited about what's happening at tapestry as you guys are kind of going into the new normal. Uh, as you know, you guys are going to be uh, planting a church in Dallas, uh, have already started uh, to uh, send a worker out to Montreal, Pastor Andrew, I believe he preached last week, and, uh, and just a lot of great stuff with convergence and a, a seven-year plan. Uh, and I'm hoping that today's message could be part of what tapestry will continue to do in the future, and it could really be, I consider, a foundation of all of us in this room. So we want to talk about that, and we're going to be looking at Revelations chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Let me just quickly pray for us again. Holy Spirit, open our hearts, and may your word change us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let me read the passage again, and this is probably very familiar to many of you who've been in the church world, uh, Ephesians, uh, to the Ephesians church, the angel of the church, in Ephesus right, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love 
you had at first, some version, first love. Consider, or some versions, remember how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Uh, do the things you did at first. Redo those things that used to bring your intimacy. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I want to really ask you a simple question. Uh, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ here uh, this afternoon, or, you know, um, if you are seeking the Lord, I want to ask you this question. Uh, have you tasted the love of God? Really tasted what this gospel message is saying, that God so loved the world, he sent his only son so that you and I could experience his forgiveness, redemption, and experience how we were created to be loved. All right. We may think the love of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a parent is the most incredible love that we've ever experienced. But the Bible says, no, we were created to be loved by the God Almighty. And when we taste this love, when we experience this intimacy with God, I want to tell you, everything changes. Uh, we will not be the same. So I want to ask you this question. Have you tasted the love of God? Where are you? in your intimacy with the Lord. You know, um, in college, I started writing journals, and I pretty much wrote journals for the last, like, 40 years, I, I guess, almost, yeah, almost 40 years. And uh, I, I remember starting journal out of a very vain motivation. I read this book called uh, Shadow of the Almighty, and it was a, a missionary uh, who went to Inca Indians, Jim Elliott. He had written these diaries, uh, and then his, he ended up becoming a martyr and dying for the Incas in South America. And his wife found these diaries, and she wrote a book. And I was a freshman in college, and I said, maybe I'll start journaling, and my wife will find, you know, my diary, and she'll write a book, you know. I was a very immature freshman. I started writing. You know, I, I, I want to just tell you, if my children ever find or anybody finds my uh, journals, please burn them, okay? Just burn them. <laughs> Because there's nothing profound in these journals. Or half the time I'm like, freshman year, I'm lonely. I think I like her, you know. <laughs> Sophomore year, I'm really, really lonely. I think I like her. You know, junior, I, I, I'm so lonely. I think, I think she's the one. It's just, it's a sad journal, all right. Half the time I, I'm, I'm depressed. I'm struggling. God, you know, why am I keep falling into this particular sense? So if you ever find my journal, burn it. But what's great about journals is that every once in a while, out of decades, there's something that you wrote that actually was impactful. And, you know, I've shared this many times at my church and other places, but you know, there's a journal that I wrote in college, handwritten. Remember those days when you write it by hand? And, and this uh, paper, it says, I love you. 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 Flip. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Flip. I love you. I love you. I love you. Flip four pages back and forth, four or five, back and forth of I love you. And it wasn't that I loved the girl. It wasn't that I was being punished. It was a moment where I really felt loved by God. And what's kind of weird about this journal is, like, as you flip the page, there's this points where you can tell somebody dropped water on the ink. You know, I think I was crying as I was writing it. And, doop, doop. <laughs> Lord, I love you. Doop. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it doesn't have to be that traumatic for you. But maybe if you've been in the church world, was it in a youth ministry? Was it in college? Or was it when you f it sang that one song and when, when you think about his faithfulness or who he is, suddenly you're like, man, there's a God who loves me. I can taste and see how good that God is. And I want to tell you that that is the foundation, the love, the grace, the mercy of God is the foundation of our faith. It's the foundation that should fuel why you're here. It's the foundation that should fuel why you want to change. That's the foundation that should fuel why we read the Bible. How are you doing with this intimacy with God? When you read this particular passage, you realize <clears throat> it's actually a shocker. Because when you read verses 1 through 3 about this church of Ephesus... Everybody should be saying, wow, this is an amazing church. 
You know, if they did a survey on Christianity today, this church would have been probably chosen as a church of that century. But we know that Jesus actually seems to point out their strength, but then say, hey, there's something terribly going wrong in this church. Let me just give you a quick historical background of the church of Ephesus. In Acts 20, uh, Paul is seen leaving the church of Ephesus after three years of investing into this church. Paul was a church planner. Many times he would go into a particular city, start a church. Sometimes he was there for months, sometimes a year. But it seems like this was one of the few churches that he was there for three years, investing his life. And in Acts 20, there's a scene where Paul is crying, and the elders are crying. And Paul says, you know what? You guys are grown. You've done great things. You're going to do great things. But beware of sheep, I mean, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. And we know in church history... That after Paul left, he gave over the church to Timothy, who also led the Ephesus church. There's also evidences that Apostle uh, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was also a pastor there in the church of Ephesus. And then church history says that after Apostle John, there's a great chance that a man named, uh, um, forgot the guy's name, Polycard. Thank you, Pastor Charles. He was here for the last message. <laughs> uh, he took over. So what you realize is there are successions of great leaders. And that's why I think there was great, great, uh, you know, characteristics of this church. So let's look at this church. Look at verse 2. And it says, uh, you know, Jesus says, and this is not a re rebuke. It's pointing out their strength. He says, I know your deeds and your hard work and your perseverance. It's a part of verse 2. Let me uh, tell you a little secret. At least it's my secret. I like hard-working church members. I'm sorry to say that. Now, Christianity is not about performance. It's not how many times you go to a cell group or come to church or like the tapestry guys that I saw here at 8 o'clock setting up everything there that you must buy for $10. Amen? <laughs> he didn't pay me. But, uh, you know, so all that stuff, right? It's not about performance, but we all know that as pastors, man, I like people that are ready to put faith into action, right? Ready to be part of a cell group, ready to be part of a prayer meeting, ready to really invest into the church with action, right? And, uh, yeah, we can get lost in that. But I believe that's part of how a church grows, how a church makes an impact. You know, when we first started GCC, like now it's 26 years ago, first five to seven years, man, we had a crew of people that was just out there. I mean, we were, you know, picking up people, like if, even if one member was like far away on the other side of the earth, we would go and pick them up. I, I, I exaggerate a little, amen? Uh, and, and he would pick them up, bring that person back. And there was actually a weird badge of honor into our fifth, sixth year. And that was, we used to look at each other and say, we're so busy, we don't have time to do our laundry. That's disgusting, amen? <laughs> All right, except for college students, they don't do laundry. Young adult, men, do your laundry, okay? You don't think you smell, but you do. How come it's only the guys who are laughing? Okay, let me, Lord, get me focused. Okay. And, uh, you know, we were really, really busy. And, and you know what? When God is fueling his church, people will step up and go into action. Let's really be honest. Do you want to go to a church where nobody wants to volunteer? Nobody wants to do anything? Hey, let's go to small group. Nah. Hey, let's participate on missions. No. Let's go to church. No. No, we, we like it when people are working hard. And Jesus here says, you're a hardworking church. But not only a hardworking church. He says in verse 3, you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Not only were they hardworking, they've gone through some difficult situation and they endured. They persevered. You know, I, I, I've met people who are hardworking until, boom, they hit opposition. And they're not hardworking anymore. They're bitter. They're not hardworking anymore. They left. But this 
church went through hard work. And when they hit difficult suffering times, they actually persevered, came out of it. Maybe even like COVID. In a lot of ways like tapestry. You guys are coming out and praise God. There's some of you that are really ready to go and make a difference through hard work and action. Well, this church had suffered through difficult time and persevered. But I really like this phrase where it says, and have not grown weary. You know, they went through a hard time, difficult time. They persevere. And I've seen people persevere, but they've grown bitter or just neutral or second-guessing, do I really want to lead a small group? Because I know how a small group leading, how much time it takes, so I'm not sure. Do You know, most of the times people who don't want to serve are the people who've served a lot before. <laughs> and when you say, you want to lead a small group? They're like, dee, 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 dee. they're calculating. You know, the person who says, I'll do it, they're like, no, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, you know? <laughs> But man, it's the person who's led small groups, went through difficult times, and COVID, you saw them in Zoom, and you felt like, these guys aren't even coming to church, I don't know what to do. They finally are coming, and you went through it, and you're not weary. You're like, oh my gosh, give me another year of small group. That was the hardest year I've ever had, but give me another, because I'm not weary. You're crazy. <laughs> This church was hardworking, persevering, and did not grow weary. And then in verse 2b, it says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who belong, uh, who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. What's going on with this? You know, uh, they saw people living in ways that was not of the scripture. Now, I know we don't like to divide it up like this always, but there are, there is a way of lifestyle that is unbiblical. Right? There is a way to live our life that will glorify Jesus. And we don't like it, but here it says these people were living a way that was wicked, unrighteous. And they moved away from that and they were moving towards living a righteous life. Not because they were righteous, but through the changing power, righteousness of Christ, they were living towards it. They, were, they had a moral life, lifestyle. Now, again, Christianity is not about morality of life. I mean, moral life, like you don't smoke, you don't drink, you know, you, you don't chew tobacco, or you don't date girls who do, amen? <laughs> You're like, what did you say that for? I don't know, I just said that. Okay, it was a long time ago when I was in college, they used to say weird things like that. And you're like, it's not about just a moral life, but they did live a life that was moving towards what the scripture seems to describe. And not only that, they were well taught. They knew the Bible, right? They knew the Bible enough that these teachers came and they taught what, that they were apostles and, and they taught scripture and they were able to sit back and go, you know what? These guys are not teaching the Bible like the Bereans of the book of Acts. Something's wrong with their doctrine. The way that he's saying it is not in the scripture. And it seems like they knew that at, even at a high level, something was not right. They were well taught. Now think about this particular church. They're hardworking. They're persevering. They don't get weary. They're, they're marching on. They actually have a lifestyle that's pointed towards what God desires, and they know their Bible. You know what? I just want to tell you, honestly, I would like this church. Amen? You know, I would, I would be, want to be part of this church. I mean, really, would you want to go to a church that don't know the Bible? Everybody always says, oh, I'm so tired. You know, who, like, nobody wants to do anything, and they love wickedness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's some, one of those situations where it looks like if you took a survey on Christianity today, you're like, this is the church to be at. Yet, what does Jesus do? He says, something is not there. So in verse 4, Jesus says, look, you have the superstructure. You look good. Everybody thinks this is it. This is the church. You have the structure. You know, you got all the furnitures correct. But in the midst of that, what is happening in your substructure, your foundation? And I think that's what tapestry is going through. Like, what are we going to do about our foundation? Because God's going to build up. But where is our foundation? And that's the seven-year plan. That's the belonging, you know. That is the serving. That is the learning. That is the encounter. 
And Jesus says here, yet I hold this against you, he says. You have forsaken the love you had at first, your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You know, um, when I was a 23-year-old starting youth ministry, I was like super passionate. I was like spastic, actually. Uh, and I remember, you know, taking over this, or going into this youth ministry, and there was a, a senior youth pastor, and there was me. And we were like pumped up. We were actually a pretty good team. And we were getting these kids. There were about 70 kids. They were so excited for the Lord. We would have these things called lock-ins. And I don't know if you ever grew up in this kind of culture. It was like 7 p.m. we start, and 7 a.m., we would end, and we would literally, almost literally pray the whole time. A little bit of music, but no, you know, Monopoly and, you know, other things. It was just praying all the time. And the, I still remember these junior high kids praying on the pews like this. They look so cute. We're like, pray for your unbelieving friend. They're like, oh, I pray for Michael. You know, and they're like just going on. And, I mean, they were bobbing like this for like hours. And I remember as a young 23-year-old guy thinking I was going to be some big dude in youth ministry, you know, thinking like, oh, when is the senior guy going to leave so I could have the show? You know, I was a very vain young man, you know, so that I can take this youth group to another level. Well, guess what? This senior guy left and everything went down. <laughs> I mean, it, it just like the kids, I, I found out later these 70 kids were grieving over a person who had impacted their life and they took it all out on me. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, the youth group actually grew, but the 70 core seemed like they hated me. I, I still remember this one uh, sixth grade uh, sister who is kind of my first ministry wound. In sixth grade, she, she used to, like, went, you know, take notes because I look around and I see people, you know, who's sleeping, drinking something and other stuff. Amen. And uh, <laughs> the sixth grade girl used to take notes. And every time I said something, she'd be like, and I just get so blessed by her. And then the senior, uh, uh, past, the senior youth pastor left, and this, suddenly she's in seventh grade. She's changing. And she's no longer taking notes. She's passing notes. <laughs> to other, you can tell. Like, they're taking and giggling, you know? And I remember one time I went by her, and I said, hey, hi, because we were in friendly terms. And she gave me a dirty youth group stare. You know one of those? Where their attitude, like, you want to die? And I remember going, oh, my gosh, what happened? And I got wounded, right? And I, I did every. I was like, you know, I was really young. I would fast three days. I would pray longer. I would prepare my message more. I would work hard. I would try to be an example. And I was going all out. But it was going down, at least in my view. And at that time, at the seminary, there was a, uh, I might have told this story, some of you might have heard, uh, a man named Reverend Conan who used to teach spiritual formation. He was like 80, 85 years old, had white hair, you know, and he would walk really slow. He literally walked like this. And you, you can make these, you know, 30 to one hour appointment to share your heart. And I mean, to me, as a 23-year-old seminarian, I thought he was Moses. You know, he had white hair, you know, and he looked, he was, he was a missionary for like 20 years. And I made this appointment with Reverend Conan, and I'm waiting, I still remember. It's a little slightly dramatized, but I'm waiting at the lunch table, and you see him walking. It took forever. <laughs> I'm like, come on. He sits down, and I start going crazy. Reverend Conan, I'm like praying, I'm fasting, and there's this girl. She's not listening. There's this other guy who's like doing crazy stuff. I don't know what, what should I do. I, I'm willing to do anything so that these kids will really love God and serve God and die for God and all this stuff. You did not want to be in my youth ministry, amen? <laughs> and what happened is Reverend Conan's on the other side, and he starts mumbling. Remember, he's like 85, and he's mumbling. He's going like, I stop, and I go, are you okay? <laughs> you know, I'm like, woo, 85, you know, are you okay? And then he says, Brother Young, keep speaking. I am interceding for you. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so I slow down. I'm like, his name is Sam, who's driving me crazy. And I got another guy named John, you know. He, he listens to me for a little bit longer, and then he says, 
He says a few other things, but then he says to me, Brother Young, something like, you're really working hard, you're really passionate, but what you need is you need to let Jesus flow out of you. And then he got up and he left. <laughs> I'm dramatizing, but it took him like 15 minutes to move on. And I was like, when I first, I go, flow. oh, yeah, I got to let Jesus flow. Then I'm like, what does that mean? Let Jesus flow out of me. I think he was saying, what Jesus was saying is, it's not about just your hard work. It's not about you enduring. It's not about you fasting and praying. Oh, yes, that can happen. But it's about Jesus changing you. It's about you becoming like Christ. It's about you having an intimacy with Jesus. And as that intimacy overwhelms you and you're in his love, that overflow of Christ spills to other people. It's about the intimacy of Christ flowing out of you to do the ministry that he has called you to do. I do want to talk to those of us who serve and who are really serving this church well. I can see it. But, you know, we know that ministry could be worship where we're worshiping God as we welcome people in, usher them Make sure they're seated in the right place. Do the worship team set up. It could be worshiping God. Or it could be just a task that's slowly seeking our worship and taking it away. This Ephesus church had great leaders, but they were slowly losing that intimacy. And Jesus said, pause. You need to stop. I'll tell you some evidence. When you start... Doing church and doing church and being at church, even all of you guys who are here, when it's not about intimacy, when it's not about pausing, as I'll talk about encountering Jesus, every time you come on Sunday, not just the music or the message, I want to meet Jesus. I think Pastor uh, Charles talked about that. The end goal is are you going to encounter Jesus? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you do, you're not going to leave this place the same. Amen. But right here, you know, if you start going to church, doing church things, and you start feeling burnt out, bitter, you start performing yourself to the top of the church ladder, you start feeling disappointed because other people aren't changing when you're working so hard. I'm like talking to myself, amen. <laughs> I need to step back and let Jesus flow out of me. Because when we do what we're going to look at correctly, just the basic stuff, somehow, even though people that we're investing into is not changing, you still, still have the joy of the Lord. Instead of getting mad at what they're not doing, I'm like talking to myself here. You have compassion. Because God has compassion. So what does Jesus say? Jesus says, hey, listen. You need to remember or consider, verse 5, how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So we're going to look at it three ways. One, remember, consider. Two, you need to repent. Three, you need to redo. All right, let's think about this uh, kind of exhortation of remember or consider. I think what Jesus is saying, look, you're working hard. You're doing a lot of stuff. You're really passionate. You have a vision. And you know what? I, 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 I'm, I'm not knocking your hard work. But you need to pause and remember it's about me. It's about you and me and me and you. And us falling in love and letting this gospel message change you. So your transformation, you becoming like Christ is part of the power that others will see. You need to pause. You need to remember. 
I, I don't know about you, but as I've been hanging out here at L.A., this place is crazy. I mean, why does it take like 30 minutes to get three miles, you know, in a car? I'm like, should I walk? No, I'll drive, <laughs> you know? It's, it's just like so busy. Then, you know, I, I, I don't want to insult anybody here, but L.A. has a distinct smell, at least the areas that I was around. It smells of like, like, kind of like pee somewhere. You know, I, I'm sorry, you know, like, you know, I mean, <laughs> Lord. And, you know, you're busy, busy doing stuff. There's things to do, things to watch, things to go. And, you know, it, it looks like you're moving forward. And maybe God is saying, you know what, you need to pause. And this might sound really simple. But believe it or not, I think it's a spiritual discipline. You need to pause, even maybe today, right now. And remember how much God loves you. That he laid down his only begotten son for you. That the greatest, the most powerful being that we actually were created to be loved by loves us. And you may think, my, I need to be loved by my girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, or our children. No, the greatest love we need is Jesus. And he is right now saying, I want to love you. I want to love you. I want you to be loved by me. Sorry for yelling, amen. I know Pastor Charles don't yell. <laughs> Jesus loves you. <laughs> you know, uh, Pastor Charles and some of the AMI pastors, we went on this retreat, and it was like, you know, no agenda retreat. You know, the agenda was get some sleep. Have fun. Actually, that was the agenda. It's because and my pastors don't know how to have fun. You got to have fun and relax. And, you know, people are waking up saying, that's the best sleep I've eaten. Slept, not eaten. <laughs> I've slept in, in many months and all this stuff. And I had so much fun. I was like, you know, it was in the waterfront. I loved the waterfront. I was snorkeling. I was playing in the water. I was playing soccer by myself against the fence. And I was like, there was this dock, and I hogged it up. I woke up really in the, early in the morning, and I just stayed there, like, and, you know, made sure I spread everything, saying, nobody come here, all right? And I was just hogging it all up. And, and it was interesting because one night, a friend pastor, I mean, they're all my friends, but this, this friend uh, pastor came over, and uh, he's like, we're talking about ministry. During COVID, it's, it's been really rough. Even if your church did well or not did well, it's been rough. And this pastor was really honest, and, uh, you know, he said to me, he's like, you know, young, I really, I'm really, he said, angry at my church. And I remember I was sitting there at night. I was praying. You know, I was like getting more intimate with the Lord. I'm like, whoa, my friend has a problem. He's like angry at his church. What kind of pastor is he? You know, I mean, I didn't say that to him. And it was only just a, just a little quick memory that went through, a thought that went through. But after he left, I was like, wow, whew, I'm much better. I, I'm, a, I'm only annoyed, frustrated, <laughs> bothered, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes I want to hurt a few people, but I'm not angry at them. You know? <laughs> and so it was funny. The next day, I, I went out. I was having fun. I was snorkeling, looking for fish in this lagoon area. No fish. I'm like literally swimming for an hour and a half to this other side. No fish. I only saw this small snail, right? And I'm coming back, you know. I'm still having fun. It was like, you know, water was, you know, I'm coming back. I'm like, I'm swimming. I'm doing these weird dives, trying to go flip upside down, doing, I think I'm a mermaid doing these things. <laughs> and as I'm doing this, God, as I'm snorkeling, says, why are you angry At your church. And I said, God, Dad, Father, that's not me. That's my friend. I'm pretty annoyed. I'm kind of frustrated. I want to hurt a few guys. But I'm not angry at my church. And I felt like God, as I was snoring, he said, you're angry. And I got out. And I sat on that dock. And I felt like he said, let me love you. Just sit here and let me love you. Now, you might say, what does that mean? Some of it is reflecting on what his love that I've touched, you know, in my diary or other places. 
reflecting on songs that have reminded me of his incredible love, reading passages. But I just sat there saying, Lord, I, I just want to be loved by you. And you know, it was weird. Like it was about 10, 15 minutes. I was just letting God love me. And then I started realizing that person doesn't have to apologize for me to love him. That sister, I can forgive her even if she's not going to forgive me. That person that I'm meeting every other week and I feel like it's going nowhere, the father has compassion on that person. And when I was being loved by the father, I found myself saying, I can have compassion for those that I were annoyed, frustrated, and few I wanted to hurt. Maybe you need to be loved by God. You know, if you feel like I can't forgive that person, and I know this is very sensitive, some, it's very, very deep for some people, or I can't, you know, I'm just jaded by this. You know what? I got to tell you, when you sit at his feet and you get connected with the gospel love of God, the grace of God, you really understand some of these things starts melting away. Maybe today is the day you need to taste the love of God. Remember, pause, pause, hold, take a breath right here, right now. We'll try to do it as we take communion. Right here, right now. Don't think about where you're going to go or what you're going to do. Or where you came from, right here, right now, pause and say, Father, I want to be loved by you. Because you know what? When I look at the Bible, God's not up in heaven going like this. You know, you know, if you really have the right attitude, maybe I'll love you. Like, wow, you didn't raise your hand at that song, buddy. I'm not sure if I'm gonna love you today. No, he's like this. I'm gonna love you. Remember, consider, pause. Second, repent. Repent. You know, I, I tell my church all the time, I say repent. Repent is not a dirty word. If I say to you, repent, 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 that's not a dirty word. It shouldn't even be an offensive word. You know, a lot of times in the uh, American translation, there's a sorrow, there is this guilt feeling. I think there is biblical conviction. It can be shameful guilt, which is wrong, but biblical conviction. And there's that emotional sorrow. But in the Greek, there's more emphasis on turning. The father is saying, you're going the wrong way. You think you're going to do the right thing and you think that's going to satisfy you, but it's going to destroy you. You need to turn. You think your way, your desire, your pleasure is the way it's supposed to be, but it's going to kill you. You're going to get addicted. Turn to me. Don't go here. Don't go there. Come home. Repent. Come home. It's... It's like that prodigal son in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 17, the young son who was out there squandering, thinking, this is life, this is life. And finally, he's stuck with the pigs. And it says he came to his senses and said, what am I doing? I got to go home. That's repentance. And I know you've heard this before, probably, I'm sure, here at, at Tapestry. But when you repent and you're going to go back home, do you, want, do you want me to tell you what the Father is doing? He's saying, well, come home. Come home. Now, I've said this many times at my church and other places. If you are in this room and you're saying, you know what, Pastor Young? Uh, <clears throat> I am so far from God. I barely made it here. Somebody dragged me. I didn't want to be here. I'm not even sure why you're here. I'm here. And why, I don't know why you're yelling at me. Okay, so again, I'll, I'll tone down. <laughs> if you're like that, do you mean to tell you if you feel, if you're that brother or sister that you feel farthest, the most shame from God, if you only knew what I've done and what I'm thinking about you right now, do you mean to tell you where God is? Right behind you. The Father is right behind you. I tell so many college and young adults, when you feel far, 
you know what you need to do? Turn around. Because he is waiting there for you. You see that in Luke chapter 17. How do I know this? I, I share this all the time. I have three kids. Do you know who I'm thinking and praying and most like focusing on? The one who's causing the trouble. Amen. If the other two are doing well, I'm like, ah, go ahead, roam free. You're fine. You know what? You do whatever you want. The one who's causing the trouble. I'm like, oh, Lord, what am I going to do with that boy? <laughs> you know, what am I going to do with this? I don't know what to do. You know, like, I'm right behind them. The one who doesn't want to talk to me. The one who, because my heart, the father's, parent's heart, is close to the one who is lost. So if you feel lost, the Father is close. You need to repent. You need to turn. Because he wants to bring you home. He wants to show you his way, his truth, his life. Stop making excuses. Stop letting sin and the simple pleasure entangle you. Stop letting laziness swamp you. You know, everybody has atrophied. You know, because it's like, oh my gosh, I got to go to church. I got to put a shirt on, you know. I got to drive 10 minutes, you know. My band, my worship team, like, because we don't have a, a place. We have to set up, break down. Can you imagine setting up and breaking down all this every, every year? We've done it for like 26 years. My worship team, like, they went on a mutiny. They're like, we will not do this no more. Buy us a building. And I was like, okay, okay. And then I, I compromised. I said, oh, you don't have to set the drum, just the cajon. They're like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's better. Yeah, it, like we have atrophied. Is there such a word? And we need to come back. I don't know what that has to do with repentance, amen? <laughs> we need to turn to Christ, all right? Lord, I don't know where that came from, but let, let's go back, Okay. Oh, laziness, yes. Don't let it swap you. Let, don't let busyness distract you. Let's turn and come home. Lastly, remember, redo, refresh, restore. What are the things that used to remind you of Jesus? Sometimes there's so many times in the Old Testament where you're supposed to put the stone. You're supposed to build a, a place where you remember that this is where you encounter that ladder. This is the place where you crossed over the Jordan River. This is the place that God did something. And there is a great uh, value in, in stopping and redoing those things that sparked your heart. What did you do that used to spark your heart? I remember I shared this once, and this guy said, I used to write poems. So he started writing poems. You know, I used to sing to the Lord. So this guy started singing. For me, when, when I'm like not doing well, you know, I try to think creative ways. One of the most creative ways for me during COVID that kept my heart going was gardening. I became a farmer, amen. I was like growing beans and zucchinis and cucumbers and, and peas and you name it, I had it, okay? It started all with this Korean thing called genip, right? And then it went all, all out. I was out there all the time and then it became my idol, so I had to repent. <laughs> but I used to go into the garden many times and really experience God. But my classic is journaling and actually taking walks around green places, because I'm just saying that because it's hard to focus on Jesus on L.A., Cape Town, <laughs> but green places. And I, I, I walk. Uh, but one of the things I ended up picking up was uh, my guitar. I used to be a worship leader. Can you believe that? Yeah, I used to lead worship, many, many retreats. Uh, I, I'm a terrible singer, so what they used to do is they would uh, turn my mic off after I said, let's praise the Lord. And they turn it off and they turn it back on only when I talk. And it was very humilifying. Okay? I know there's no such a word, but it was very humbling, right? But I just kept going. And, uh, you know, I, I started like, and for me, I have to kind of switch it up. And I remember picking up my guitar that I haven't picked up in like 10 years during COVID. I started playing old songs, you know. As the deer. I don't know if you know these songs, you know. Lord, I lift your name on high, you know. And uh, I hit the song that I used to sing, especially during finals and difficult time. I'm going to try to sing it for you, and you may die. 
It goes like this. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. My kids pray because uh, I'm toned up, amen. <laughs> So you're like, what did he say? Well, let me just read it for you, just in case you don't know what I just sang, all right? <laughs> Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord. Lead me home. Man, I remember singing that song in college, crying, because I knew I was going to flunk the final. <laughs> Take me home, Lord. It's over, Lord. My mom's going to kill me, you know. And I, I remember I was just, you know, I was singing this song, and I, I sing better with the guitar, honestly. <laughs> I am weak. I am worn. Lord, through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. Maybe you need to put that song that blessed you on repeat and let it minister to you. Maybe you need to take that verse that gave you life and memorize it again or look at it in a different version. Maybe you need to go and take a good walk with the Lord. Maybe you need to call up a mentor or a friend and say, hey, can we talk to one another once a month, every other week to pray? Because my intimacy with God has been severely weakened during COVID. What used to spark your heart for the Lord? You need to repent. You need to remember and we need to redo and cry out for the hand of God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. If you don't mind, if you can stand. And uh, Pastor Charles will be taking us into communion. But I would like you to just pray uh, and invite the Holy Spirit. And maybe right now in this room, you know you are far from God. Well, we want to welcome you. We want to thank that you are thank you that you are here because God is not far from you. Maybe there's some of you in this room that God is sparking your heart, saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'm knocking at your heart." Remember what you used to do when we used to eat supper together? You used to sing that song. You used to take that walk. You used to write that poem. You used to listen to that music. You used to talk with that friend. And God is saying, I'm, I'm knocking at your heart. Why don't you open it and let me come in. Let me minister to you with my love, with my presence. If you don't mind, you know, if you can just lift your hands up, whatever form is most comfortable, high, low, side. And I, I make my church do this a couple times. Right where you are, can you say in your heart, inside your heart, scream it if you want to, in your heart. Why don't you say, God, Father, I am here. Right here, right this moment, right here. Not what I'm going to do afterwards. Not what happened to me before I got here. I am here, right here, right now. Father, I am here. Sometimes it's good to take one deep breath. Father, I am here. Don't think about your friend. I am here. You have always been here. Father, I am here. You have always been here. 
Touch me with your love. Touch me with your grace. Restore me. Father, I am here. You have always been here. Let your love bring me to repentance. Turn me around. Come, Holy Spirit. Every time you come in the name of the Lord, my picture is God the Father has his arms open to bring you home. How many times will he forgive you? 70 times 7. We can't make God's grace cheap, but I want to tell you God's grace is powerful. He brought you to touch you. You may work hard, but what you need is his love right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Only you can change us with your love. Your love did come down to rescue us. Your love came down to set us free. Your love came down to turn us. Your love came to heal. Your love was shown on the cross. And God, I don't know other than to come to you and ask, seek and knock. Let your love fall down. Because someone in this room needs your touch. Someone in this room needs your presence. Lord, I pray for the prodigal. Let her or him come home. Let the knock be heard. I pray for the older son who is in the house but does not understand the heart of the father. Lord, we are serving, but our heart of worship has left us. Oh, Lord, we want to worship you. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you want to touch us. Lord, bless this church. I know you're going to, you're working through the seven-year plans. I know that there's some great stuff ready for them. But I pray that you will deepen their intimacy with you, Lord. I know that this is Pastor Charles' desire, Father, the leadership of this church. We will, this church will go deep. And they will say at Tapestry, there are people that are in love with Jesus. And that love is transforming them. Come, Holy Spirit. We are here. You have always been here. Touch us with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in a time of prayer. If we can maintain the posture of receiving. I'm going to lead us in a time of coming to the Lord's table. As we come, let us remember again His great love for us. Let us remember the best thing about being a Christian is being loved by God. That we are at our best when we love God and love others. That is the entirety of all of God's commandments, to love God and to love others. Let us remember his great love for us. We're encouraged to come to the table with repenting hearts, careful, examined hearts. Let's confess that we have an imperfect love towards God and for others. That very often in those fissures, we create problems, tension, and brokenness. 
Let's acknowledge them for ourselves and let's repent of it now. Let's now heed the command to redo, to do what, what we once used to do, and namely today, coming to the table. We are commanded to remember Christ's love for us, his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. As we come to the Lord's table with friends, with brothers and sisters, we remember that we belong to the community of faith that we belong to one another as an act of love. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Bible tells us that he took bread and amongst his friends, he broke it. And he handed to them saying, eat for this is my body broken for you a sign of covenant with you. And likewise, he took the wine, poured it into a cup, and he told his disciples, drink, drink, for this is a sign of my forgiveness of sins. Every sin, hidden or out in the open, this cup, this drink, it will remove its stain. And all who drink from it will thirst no more. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and receive the elements. As the ushers prepare, will you continue to pray and just seek the Lord here at this moment and recognize that He is here with us. He is here now at the table inviting you to this intimate act of eating together. So intimate. He desires to be so intimate with you that he wants to put his flesh, he wants to put his blood in your hands for you to touch, to see just how tangible and real his love for you is his forgiveness, that this isn't just theoretical. This isn't something that we just sort of speak to to make ourselves feel better. But this is as real as the air you breathe, the food that you eat, the very blood that's coursing through your veins. It's as real as all of eternity. He is here, ready to love you, ready to receive you just as you are. You have no need to prove anything. There's nothing more you can do to be loved by God. You are perfect as it is. Let Him love you. Let Him cover the multitude of your sins. Let Him love you. Ushers, if you can start to invite our friends forward to receive the elements. Here at our church, we receive the elements and return to our seats, and together we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. Here walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, the perfect, oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. He walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering, and blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, and oh, praise the one who would reach for Son of suffering. So some imagine you are distant and removed, but you chase us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embraced, and in the end the proof is in your some imagine, some imagine you, oh, are distant and removed, but you chase us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embraced, and in the end the proof is in your In the end, the proof is in your wounds, blood and tears. How can it be that there's a God who weeps and there's a God who bleeds? And oh, praise the one who would reach for. Son of suffering, blood and tears, so oh blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps, yes, there's a God who believes, and all oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. So hallelujah to the son of suffering, hallelujah, hallelujah to the son of suffering, hallelujah, and hallelujah to the son of suffering, hallelujah, and hallelujah to the son of suffering. As a way of proclaiming the Lord's death, let us raise the bread that represents the body of Christ. And we feel it in our hands, the very tangibleness of God, his real love for us. Through his broken body, we receive the love of Christ. Let us eat. Let's raise the juice that represents the blood of Christ. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we remember 
that the Lord's final words were not do or go, but it's the words, I am coming back for his bride. He is coming back to give us his perfect love. We drink to one day to that wedding. We drink because his blood that has been shed reminds us that there's no need for blood shed in this world. That we have found perfect peace in his love. Let us drink to this promise. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering Hallelujah, Hallelujah to 
Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, I'm struck by your kindness. How kind you are, God, that when in this world we face constant pressure to do more, do better, achieve this, have that, Lord, you invite us. You invite us to simply come and receive your love. For that has always been your heart, to love your people and be glorified in that. And so Jesus, we take this moment now to step back, to pause and to repent, to confess, Lord, that how easily our hearts become so divided, how easily we make idols of the things of this world, all these things, Lord, that you have given gifts for. But Father, we turn now and we say that we wanna love the giver more than the gifts. So Lord, even in our offering, I pray that it would be an expression of that. It would truly be an expression of love and outpour because we have been loved so well. And we wanna love you, God, with all that we have, whether it be money, time, our efforts, our thinking, our thoughts, our words, our actions, all of it, Lord. We love you, God. And we thank you, Father, for your endless relentless and pursuing love after us. And so Lord, we wanna pray the prayer in Ephesians 3. That for this reason, we bow our knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being grounded, rooted in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is our prayer, Jesus. We thank you. We worship you with our grand, even meager at times, but our full expression of love for you, Lord. Praise you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'll finish this morning by singing one more song to give him glory and praise. We'll sing this together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. I'm 
Holy Spirit, move in our souls. Renew our mind and open the floodgates of your incredible love. At this time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the incredible love of God the Father, may the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.
your faithfulness in every step I've taken.